chamber members. I really appreciate being here and having this opportunity each year. Um, I wanted to share some silent information with you regarding our district's finances, our current projects, and um, also some information regarding achievement, and then ultimately how the community can continue to help support our kids and um, help them to grow and support both in the community and our families. Um, this is our big mission to get started. I'm fortunate to work with five board members who are the, the body of the school district's governing body. Today we have with us President Andy Maletti, Maletta, sorry, and also um, our Vice President Paula Vasquez. In the audience, um, those members who had commitments, obviously, with um, their employment today that we're not able to be here are Lori Wilkie, who is a member, Dr. Shawna Finley, who is a member, and um, also Troy Wilkins, who is our secretary. Um, we have three tables of just various district directors and also principals, assistant principals, who really help to make our mission and vision come to life for our students. Um, it's their help along with our teachers and our support personnel that really make the difference for kids every single day. It's always a great opportunity to give a call about um, different things that are going on in our district to include updates that families have noticed. Um, we've had a lot of compliments on the LED lighting projects throughout the district. Our building is so clean, our transportation team um, and their efforts every day to make sure that they're very warm and inviting to our kids. So it really takes all of us and I really am always so appreciative of all of our kids and our work. To share with you um, just some fiscal things, I have just a few highlights here for you. So in this last two-year budget, and we're getting ready to prepare for our uh, budget for 2023, um, so that's going to be coming up. But in 21, for the 22-23 school year, the uh, state of Indiana gave an additional $1.2 billion to education. In that time, um, that assisted us because our basic tuition support increased um, 3% from 2021 to 2022. And also, um, it should be noted that that is after a decrease from uh, a 2.1% decrease that we had previously. So during this time frame, with the additional dollars that were allocated of Portage, again, that 3%, um, we worked very hard. Uh, the board allocated a lot of dollars to increase the, um, salaries and wages for our support staff members um, as well as our teachers. Our teachers received an increase that was third highest in the region and ninth highest in the state last year. And again, it's just showing that the of operating with dollars in the classrooms. Um, I want to share something that just happened last week. Board of Schools is very uh, fortunate based on the fiscal responsibility of the school district, specifically our school board, who oversees the budget. And we were just confirmed last week with FTP goal rating to once again reaffirm our AA plus program rating and AA minus underlying school rating. And this is the highest rating amongst Indiana schools. That's a huge um, accolade for this community. And obviously it shows that the school is working with the board over time and has continued to still prioritize. <laughs> Just to share some budgeting information with you, um, a few years back they did change how the budgets look as far as um, the, different, the, the, the different accounts. So now we have an education and an operations fund that serve as the school pension that fund and the rainy day. So, just to share um, some things about the education fund with you. Um, these are expenses that are defined by the State Board of Accounts that are specific to instruction. So our teachers, our support staff, our instructional support staff, and also the supplies that go into what takes place in a given classroom. Um, we also have specialty programs. This includes our guidance departments as well, health services, our library media centers, so there's a lot that is in the education fund. 
I think it's really important not only to highlight the idea of being so fiscally responsible in the school district, but that over 86% of our budget and allocated dollars go to salaries and benefits of teachers and instructional assistants. We are putting the dollars in the classroom as the state, of course, would like us to do. So again, I think that's a real strong priority and focus. Of course, when you get into operations, um, now this is utilities, this is custodial, this is security, school resource officers, our maintenance crews, school buses, all of that. So when you look at the size of our budget, which is about 86 million, and you consider that about 86% of that budget goes into the classroom, we've still got a lot to cover with a budget to be able to keep our schools up to speed with maintenance, with updates, with revisions, with renovations, and very proud to stand here as your superintendent and say, we've been able to do these things and we have a facility assessment plan that we've continued to work to include what's currently ongoing, almost $16 million of work that it does not cost the community in a raise to your tax rates. So this has been something that we have been able to manage through our tax rate management plan and we have just prioritized several years out and we are ahead of schedule and we'll be sharing some of those things with you here shortly. Um, moving into the debt service bonds, these are, these are payment bonds that come with school loans um, and the revenue from the same sources as the operations fund. When I became superintendent, the one thing that we um, had noticed when sitting with the board was we had a lot of debt falling off and you know, when we think about our, our homes, you know, the whole idea is you don't want to have a bunch of debt, but the reality was that we really were getting debt falling off so quickly and then on top of that, we weren't managing our tax rate to make certain, not that we have, want to raise that, that tax rate, but we also need to make improvements for our buildings, our facilities, our parking lots, and all of those things that um, help our school to be maintained, safe, and orderly. And then we have the rainy day fund, and this was established um, many, many years ago, but in 2001, the school board on December 20th had decided that those allocated funds are to finance shortfalls other than wages and benefits, and that we would use those funds to appropriate in emergency settings. Um, we have done a really good job of keeping that budget healthy. Um, I will tell you that in 2017, 2018, we did use five million from that fund to help um, with the renovations at Porter High School West. But other than that, we've not taken additional funds out of there. And one thing that I think the school board has every right to be extremely proud of is when this pandemic hit, um, we didn't know that there would be dollars, federal dollars to assist for opportunities to keep our people employed and working, um, whether they could be in our schools or not. And we had a plan with our rainy day fund that if necessary, we could keep everyone home and without having to come in and jeopardize their health and safety and be able to be home with their families without missing any pay for over nine months, almost 1,400 employees. Now, as you know, there was a funding that came um, that, that then we did not have to do that, but we just were looking to see that we could make sure that we weren't gonna have our employees um, without their, their needs to be able to make a living wage, even if it would, of course, not their fault to cut out into the building at times. <clears throat> to share a little bit with you about facilities, um, we have some current projects going on, and our new green <coughs> lab, if you look here um, on your right hand side of the screen, L3, um, I won't explain what that is because it's going to be um, something that will be shared with the community October 25th, which we would invite you to attend at Portage High School West. It is the previous West pool. So you see behind there, again, we didn't want to give it all away in the picture, but you see behind there that that space is now a large learning lab. Um, this is a great opportunity. Over time, um, when the board has went to various trainings and professional developments, we have learned about a couple of school districts who took a space that was a pool and were able to renovate that space for learning. So we visited a few school districts that did this in Central Indiana, and Bishop Gold did something like this too, and our team attended that. Um, and what we did now 
is we have a, an instructor and an instructional assistant who are placed there to me every day. And our students rotate throughout the district going to an in, in school district field trip and they are there for a half a day after completing some modules. It's STEAM and STEM related, so we're focusing on those up and coming um, professions that we don't even necessarily know exist yet, and this is for our K to five students. Um, it's a great opportunity, and it's something that we really look forward to sharing with the community. Of course, that was when we had two pools, now we're down to one, and if you've not seen the gorgeous pool that we have at Portage High School East, it's something else we're extremely <coughs> proud of. Um, but maintaining two pools was causing somewhat of a struggle for everyone involved, and they needed to be updated for a few decades. So that was a priority, but we just felt like one good pool was going to do a trick for us. Also, ongoing projects, as I shared, the LED lighting project, we just received a rebate check from NIPSCO for $86,000, and we have another set of rebates in the works as well for these lighting projects. But really, it's important to share that these projects are much more conducive to the learning environment. The lights are just so much easier um, and, and really have brightened our school even more so. Um, we also have an inclusive playground that's going in at South Haven Elementary. This is a collaboration through our partnership committee. Um, Trustee Clancy has uh, very generously with the township um, donated many, many dollars, um, may I say? Over hundred thousand um, to this, yeah, to this, to this, um, to this cause, and so this playground is similar to Hannah's Hope. It is an all-inclusive playground for our students to be able to share and play and connect together um, while outdoors. And we chose um, South Haven for many reasons. Number one, the PTO was very interested in helping, and they raised over forty thousand dollars also to contribute to this project. Um, and then also, it was a great opportunity because having the inclusive playground in Portage with Hannah's Hope, then it gave our students and South and the South Haven community also an opportunity to have an inclusive playground. So we're really excited about it. Um, I had one final touch that I wanted on that project, and we have an exterior walking path that is cement around that. And again, just encouraging all of you to visit that playground, just take a stroll, walk walk around and just see kids and hopefully see them enjoying what's to come here soon. So they're in the process of installing all this right now and we will be having, having an opening for that as well and I will make sure that we communicate that date. Um, we do have a new Jumbotron at Portage High School in the stadium. This is for our track team, our football team, our soccer teams. It's really been a great addition. Um, fans are really enjoying it. And I want to share also that this is curricular based. So we have a new broadcasting program for students to engage in for career and technology education. And those classes are creating the content that's going to be on those boards and also doing the um, free plays that the students, if you've been to a game lately, the football team is under a tent and they've got a big TV and they're watching replays. So it's just a great, exciting time. And again, that's, that's students that write work for us. And our elementary and middle school library renovation projects. So this is creating innovative future ready media centers. And we've been working alongside um, Jesse Butts with the Florida County Library. And we really studied what, what future ready schools and the framework for that with media centers what we can do in our in our schools. And ultimately, we want to always make sure that when we're renovating spaces, that it is for the overall good of all of our students. We want all students to have equitable opportunities to experience the various things as we're updating them. So that's why we did the media center in each of our schools at the elementary and middle schools. Um, the high school, as you know, has the great library at uh, that's accompanied with the field house. So that one did not be renovated. Um, we have switched, and it's been a great project, but it's very daunting. We switched to a genre-focused media center, so if you think now, when you go to a regular public library, the county is gonna be doing this too within the next year. When you go to a typical library and it's Dewey Decimal System, right? Well, what we're finding is, through the idea of an innovative library space, that it's more appealing to kids and all of us as adults to have more like a Barnes and Noble setup. So instead of them being by Dewey Decimal System, it's by genre. 
So if you like thrillers, if you like um, sports biographies, it will all be based on that. So it helps a lot with the flow of things we visited. Specifically at Central, we had an opportunity to tour that library now that it is up and running with a few of our students, and they really enjoy it. And uh, the days of you put your ruler in and you make sure it saves your spot and you pull the book and make sure it goes right back there because the Dewey Decimal System, we're done with that. We had a little panic for a second. Uh, Mr. Lessage oversees our media team. And the one thing that happened was we talked about how our early learners, they need to flip through their books. And so we also have now put in place where there are, I'm going to say crates, or not the right word, but they can take these and they can take the whole thing back and look at it, or they can just grab a whole pile of books, go to the table, and there was a little bit of body language change when we discussed this. And when Jesse, one of our media groups said, okay, well, what happens when they put them back? And he said, your books will never be in order. <laughs> it took a couple meetings, and now they're so thrilled, but Again, we want to make these spaces meaningful to our kids, empower them to explore that love of learning and that love of reading, but we need to do it in a way that is appropriate for them to feel comfortable and empowered to explore. Sharing with you achievement. As you know, we have all um, been dealing with this pandemic for entirely too long, and national um, research is actually showing that the pandemic compounded loss. It's going to take approximately five years um, for schools to be able to get past. So we've been very dedicated and focused on this. Um, this impact resulted in public law 211-2021 and this was just to study the academic impact of COVID. So IDOE, the Indiana Department of Education, partnered with the National Center for Assessment and they looked at research-based practices that would help students accelerate their learning. Because student learning accelerated is more like, it's called something similar to saying, when you need it, then I'll teach it to you. So what that means is instead of going back and filling in gaps, because there's gonna be gaps in the learning significantly more so with all of the virtual that had to occur in, for these students. Um, instead, it's we're gonna get there and you're gonna learn that, but I'm not even gonna go back and teach it until it's time for you to need it. So it's kind of like on demand, accelerating your learning and fully knowing that it's gonna take probably multiple attempts. So the academic needs is based in the studies and findings and it's again, accelerating the learning, focusing on everyone moving forward instead of trying to go backwards and fill gaps because while you're filling those gaps, that compounded learning loss is still building because you're not able to get to the content they are at now. So we've got to start where they should be, and instead of going backwards, fill in as we continue to progress forward. Running backwards is not going to help anything it's going to hurt. A lot of research was actually done about this um, during the time after Hurricane Katrina, and they use a lot of that research on how schools were able to make up those learning gaps and this was one of the ways that um, that National Center for Assessment was able to help the Indiana Department of Ed. So, I learned the spring 2022. I want to share down with you in the corner here, you see, oh, that's windy. Okay, so under the bottom there in Indiana, you see that the average percentage of pass. So over here, third grade, 40%. 41% fourth grade. Now remember, there's been four years of four new tests in the state of Indiana, and we're all trying to get used to this. And furthermore, I want to share with you that we also skipped one of the tests in that four-year process because of COVID while the students were home. Because remember that first March 2019 when we went home, that's about the time I learned to take place. So with that, um, I want to share a couple of things with you. So a few decades ago, um, then the U.S. decided that we were going to start isolating skills when teaching them. Because if we, could, if we could just focus on this and get kids to be able to do this and remediate it until they got it, and then we move on and we go to the next isolated skill and the next isolated skill. Well, after several decades of doing that, what we learned is, and I'm sure that you've seen this in your own home, 
that then when students try to put all those skills back together to be able to apply them in a new setting or in multiple steps, it's been so isolated that they can't. The connection has been lost between one set of skills and the next set of skills and how they work together. So we've since gotten our act together and we've started to now, as a nation, say teaching in isolation doesn't work. Instead, we need to, to vary the level of the difficulty. So the depth of knowledge, how, how significantly hard or not is something, and then build on the concept, make it more difficult and a higher depth of knowledge and for the students to be able to know and understand as they're ready for it. But never take out that whole application of those skills working in unison. So the state test, the last four years that I was talking about changes, that's what the test is now doing. It's analyzing how well that they can utilize those sets of skills and apply them in new situations that are presented on the island test. So when you see that the state of Indiana is a 40% pass, you'll see Portage is 4.74% in third grade below the state average. So I am not here to tell you that we don't have work to do because we're not at the state average on any of those areas that are orange from this test this, this spring in the English language arts. Um, but I am here to tell you that we have a significant and solid plan and I'm gonna share some of that with you next. This is math and you'll see there's not one green section here. Again, in third grade, 48.7% of third graders across the state have passed the assessment. Portage, 43.57. Um, there are definitely areas we have more growing to do. I will tell you nationally, um, math took the heaviest hit with COVID. Normally we would think reading, it's math. Um, and in the state of Indiana, that's the same thing. And in the state of Indiana, middle school students, now if you think about the growth and development of a middle school student, middle schoolers really have a significant amount of compounded learning loss. Um, and we, we have to prioritize that, but again, also be mindful of the areas that we need to grow in general. But of course, there should be always something to look, to celebrate. Um, we have to have hope, we have to have kind of that opportunity to say, okay, so where did we perform well? And I got here a slide for you that shows which um, groups of students in ELA and math um, outperform the state averages, and then I also have for you the state average and their NWBA score that was outperformed. NWBA is the assessment we take three times a year to help us target students where they are and what growth method, or, I'm sorry, what growth benchmark that we need to get them to in the winter and in the spring. And these schools at the bottom did outperform on the state average and their growth targets that what we were indicating on our spring assessment, how they would do, they outperform that. So going back to that public law for COVID response in 2021 came ESSER funding. And I think it's important to share some information with you on this. The CARES Act won, um, our allocated budget was a little over 1.1 million. Um, these funds had to be expended by this September. We had done that and we had done that in a good timely manner. We did have to, to share uh, with our non-public schools an equitable share fee of $20,000 that went to various private schools. Uh, this CARES Act fund was the only particular part of ESSER that had to have that non-public share. ESSER two and three do not have a public share. So all those dollars in, in the first one, other than that uh, non-public opportunity there, that we um, had used safe and secure learning environment, high achievement, and technology is where we spend our dollars. Um, I will tell you that a lot of that goes into air quality, HVAC projects, technology in the classrooms. Now, not in that particular one, but I'm just giving you some information about where those categories are. High achievement, finding ways to eliminate that learning loss, make that gap smaller um, instead of kind of keeping it flat, but not at all eliminating it or bringing it closer to grade level. After two, on the right there, the um, total allocation of a little over five million. We have a balance at this point in time of $920,000 in that fund. Um, you can see the full presentations on our financial portion of our website to break down these things 
further for you, but I did at least want to give you an overview. That balance is going to work um, on air quality and our HVAC improvements that we're continuing. We have done our chillers. We're now looking at our unit ventilators um, in classrooms and again, conducive to the learning environment and just increasing um, that, that quality of air going through our classrooms. And then as a free allocation is a little over 11 million and we still have 8 million there. Looking at those same things, and again, the plan um, just this week shared the most recent update with the school board of the things that are to come in answer two and three. We took a survey with our families as well as our teachers, and um, we looked at what they wanted these dollars to be spent on so long as they met within the requirements. And again, we chose to go with safe and secure learning, high achievement technology. There are some other um, opportunities there. We but we felt that these would be most meaningful for our students. Also under high achievement, we looked to keep class sizes down. So we um, funded some additional teaching positions for um, class size reduction during this time as well. So one of my favorite things um, that is not a typical educator response is um, education is a business. And, and a lot of times educators don't like to think of education as a business, but it is. We need to be mindful of the product that we put out into the community. We need to make certain that our students are good citizens. We need to make sure that they're productive. We of course want them to come back and live in Portage Township and be contributing members of society. We want them to be um, mindful of others around them. We want them to respect uh, their elders and we also want them to be models model students for the students who are younger than them. But again, through that, there's things that oftentimes are in our control of the school and those items that aren't. Now, you'll never hear me make an excuse for things that are out of our control. Instead, we find ways to eliminate the variance that kids might have based on circumstances that they're coming to us with. So when I talk about high reliability organizations, my team today before you, um, there was a time that they were a little stressed when I would bring this up because it was a huge undertaking. I literally said everything we've ever done, consider it below the club. All curriculum, all ways that we address instruction doesn't work. Again, that's coming from that. This was pre-pandemic, but that was stemming from that whole idea that isolating skills is never going to get our kids to be able to be productive, contributing members who are problem solvers, who think critically, who are compassionate, who communicate well, we had to change. So a high reliability organization means that within the organization they operate in a predictable, repeated manner. They have a system that is consistent and they are focused on the idea that making sure a catastrophic error is eliminated before it happens. You have to anticipate what could go wrong and what are you going to do when it does. A student's uh, family that is now homeless, how does that change their emotional well-being? How does a, a child who's coming to school hungry, a child who had done really well in school and now mom and dad have been divorced and now the student's not engaged. A student whose mom maybe was just left by dad and now she's working multiple jobs and I'm Great, helping my younger siblings do their homework at night, and then I'm sleeping on my desk during the day. We have to anticipate these things. And for those students who have a two household income, or mom who's a stay at home mom and dad's working, whether it be a traditional or a non traditional family, whatever non traditional means this, these days, all I'm saying is all kids come and have experienced something. And it is our job to make certain that whether we know their circumstance or not, build a relationship, we assume that something in their life is causing some troublesome thoughts, troublesome feelings, and we build a relationship to make things work for them. So this is really important because it requires us to have a system as a school district. So I had to talk about the whole importance of these organizations that they're preoccupied with failure. They resist simplification. Oh, you know, sometimes we think we figured it out, like isolating skills. And then the more that you get into it, you realize you've simplified the curriculum to the point that there's nothing left. And, and I would say that, that used to work for us. We got great results when it was high step because that's how the test assessor is. 
But now, chess doesn't assess that way, and we have to stop thinking in that simplified way as well. They are sensitive to operations, they embrace resilience, and they elevate expertise. So how does that you know, model of an organization then flip to schools? And my team and I are huge, and when I say my team, I'm talking our teacher, our leadership team, we are driven by outcomes for our students, increasing achievement. And because of this, we follow Robert Marcon, who's a researcher of 40 years who has evidence-based practices in education. This thing does not like it. So, in order to be a high reliability school, you have to first start, of course, with a safe and so supportive collaborative culture. And then you move up to level two, effective teaching in every classroom, a guaranteed and viable home curriculum. Now, Dr. Marzano will say that if you have those first three levels, you can absolutely be a highly reliable school or a school district. Those additional two are kind of like the focuses, okay? But what I want to share with you is our commitment to being a high reliability organization, a high reliability school district. Portage Township Schools just received our certification in 2022, at the, uh, the spring of 2022. A lot of hard work with the people in front of you and our teachers who had to demonstrate for every indicator that would incorporate into being safe, supportive, and collaborative that we were making measures and gains and providing artifacts to show that we were making that progress and commitment. We surveyed our families, our students, all of our employees, and we made change. PTS um, has the district level one certification and each individual school of our 11 schools has their certification as well. 13% of schools nationwide follow high reliability schools are level one certified, 13%. 2% of Indiana district schools are level one certified. We are the third district in the entire state who is certified. And 9% of individual schools in Indiana have their individual school certification. As you know, there's well over 250 school districts in the state of Indiana. Then you consider how many schools are in each of those districts. And there are districts with 100 buildings. Of that, we have, there's 9% of schools with their own certification, not just the district. But we're not stopping there. We're on to level two. We started out this year with Marzano's Research Laboratory. And what we're doing now is effective teaching in every classroom. That certification we anticipate to come at the end of the school year. However, I will tell you, because the whole idea, again, is being highly reliable. If we have to adjust, and if we need to take more time, we will. But our goal right now is to make to try to have this done by the spring. Otherwise, Regardless, my hope is to stand before you next year and tell you how, we're, how we all completed level two certification. <coughs> so I wanted to share with you some of the survey results that helped kind of um, propel us forward. Again, it's kind of like what I talked about with curriculum. If you go backwards, it really doesn't help solve anything. You've got to start where you're at and see how to make those gains moving forward when those, when those situations arise. So I gave you where uh, the first two are parents. The school is welcoming. This time around, um, we increased 5%. So our parents felt our school was welcoming. Preparation for success with their child, 7% increase. Our students said they were 5% increased sense of belonging within their school, 7% increase in motivation in classroom lessons. 8% increase in students feeling that diversity of student backgrounds is valued. Our teachers said administrators create a learning center in the school environment, it increased 11% this year. And when I say this year, I'm talking about school year. And respect to children have for the staff increased 13%. But of course, we have weaknesses, and I picked four that I think are important for here. These are happen to be all specific to parents, but I just want to share some of them. Involved in parent groups at school, that declined 5%. Discussing the school with other parents, it declined 11%. Visiting school within the past year declined 19%, and help out at their child's school decreased 7%. Now, I'm not making an excuse for this because there are things that we can do to make improvements. We know COVID happened, we shrunk a lot of those opportunities, but the idea is we also pursue feedback that we need to increase those opportunities again. We can't get stuck where we were during COVID. So I have your 
really was not a solo act, it was a team performance. And that's why today I really wanted to be able to have this opportunity. And again, at the end, I plan to share how you, as businesses and community members, can assist in supporting our students and families. But um, Dr. Marzano, with his work, this is just one of his many publications that we follow. And when I shared with you that we don't make excuses, we find ways to make things happen for our kids. There are three factors that um, increase student achievement. No matter a child's background, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they've never been read to. It doesn't matter if they live in a half million dollar home with both parents. It doesn't matter if they're, whatever their circumstances are. All children can learn. That is up to us, again, to control the reliability. So what we know are school level factors that increase student achievement based on 40 years of evidence-based research. I've given them to you here. Curriculum, giving challenging goals and feedback, safe and orderly environment, parent community involvement, and collegiality and professionalism amongst our school staff. But the number one factor that increases student achievement, as you all know, is the teacher. Teachers with their instructional strategies, the classroom management, and the design of their curriculum. Again, what is how you rely on So how can you help? There's one other factor, and this other factor is the student themselves. But what we know is kids come to us from the various experiences they have, the role models or lack of role models that they have, and they come only with what's often in their backpack, as Dr. Pratasha used to say. These are the student level factors that are out of our control if you want to take it at certain value. Their home environment, their learned intelligence and background knowledge, and their motivation. But again, going back to that whole philosophy of if we build the connection, if we make sure we prioritize relationships, we, you, the schools, neighbors in our community, can impact these things. Making connection with kids, making, um, you know, several of you participate in our reality store or our job fairs that, that we're about to have at the high school. That's impactful. That creates momentum and motivation for kids. You can, just like we can, impact these of uh, learned intelligence and background knowledge. Not all kids go to museums, not all kids have a family member who's reading to them for various circumstances. We can impact that. We can help build their background knowledge by taking them to these opportunities, like I talked about in the Elf Green Learning Lab, where then they're learning about these STEAM and STEM opportunities. They're working on inquiry, communication, critical thinking, and then their home environment. We have awesome opportunities like the backpack program, that is a partnership with the Food Bank and United Way. We have opportunities that we um, capitalize on with the Township um, Trustee's Office, with our local Portage Food Pantry. We have um, six agencies that are mental health agencies that come in and provide additional support and therapy for students individually and families. It can be influenced in a way that these things that are typically considered out of our school's control, out of community's control, we have the ability to impact and in a profound way. So, how can you help? Promoting our PTS critical values. Over here on this side is our elementary poster, and on the right side here is our poster um, specific to secondary, just because it speaks a little different to the kids' age groups. Um, you know, us as models being compassionate, respectful, responsible, those things are so crucial. Um, and I know I'm so appreciative of all of the people in the community when our kids are doing something wrong, when they are acting in a manner that's not appropriate. The approach, the approach is everything. The way that we approach kids is either going to put them in that fight or flight or it's going to help them stop, pause, and understand. I'm not saying it's perfect, but it's something we all can do to help kids feel valued in their community and respected. Now, I know we all were raised that, you know, show respect, give respect. Well, we also know that the models at home may or may not be doing those things. So any way that we can connect with kids out in our community and make them feel that their value is significant. Um, moving on to another opportunity. Again, they're looking um, for uh, feedback. Feedback from all community members, all stakeholders, internal and external. So we're having um, an upcoming for forum for the community. We have one for parents that will be scheduled uh, in the coming weeks. 
but that was already scheduled. We just had one for our internal team. We're going to do a community one, and this is going to be um, just an open discussion and dialogue at 10 a.m. at the administration building. We're going to do some evening ones too, but we wanted to at least get this one on the books. That's during parent teacher conferences, and so I still kind of needed to be around, but um, we're going to do that at the building. So I invite any of you to attend, um, and we will be absolutely advertising this. Please encourage people to come. The only, the only thing I ask when people leave, and so far, like I said, we did the form with our employees, is when you leave, tell two people, just two people, something good that you either learned, something positive that you experienced, um, or someone that you met that was encouraging um, when you walked away. Because we all know there's plenty of critics in this world. They sure like social media. And you know what? Better than that is to go out to our community and spread the good. Another opportunity, and this was shared with the chamber right before we went into COVID. And this year, now that um, we are back to having paid lunches for students, we are going to be advertising for different businesses and individuals to be able to donate to that annual food party. We did have donors um, from the chamber when we originally had launched this. And again, we've had several years now where all students' uh, lunch and breakfast were free. But this year, it is back to being paid. I'm really proud, again, as fiscally responsible as Portage Township Schools is, um, and our board prioritizes that. Although it was recommended that we raise our food prices simply due to uh, the, raising, the rising prices of all things, the uh, paper products, the equipment, all of that, and the food itself, we chose not to. Again, fiscally responsible doesn't come on the backs of our students and families in our community. We kept our, our um, fees the same because we know families are struggling. Um, so you can help with the Angle Food Fund. Um, donations can be made to the Portage Township Schools Food Service Department. Um, and I will absolutely even send something out to, to Nancy if you would like to contribute, whether individually or as an organization. But again, this is how you impact those student factors that otherwise, if we just turn a blind eye, we can't change together. I want to again thank you so much. Um, this is year seven for me in this role. Um, I went into this role with my youngest daughter, who's a seventh grader in kindergarten, um, and my oldest was in third grade. So um, I'm a proud Portage mom, um, I'm a proud Portage graduate, I'm a proud Portage resident, and I couldn't thank you enough for allowing me to speak and to help contribute to the good things going on for kids. So thank you.